do the social media here at the Jefferson Group. We are so excited that you chose to join us online today. At the Jefferson Church, we believe that life is better connected. It is better connected to Christ, community, and a loving church family. So thank you for joining us today. As we dive into this week's service, let's get excited, let's prepare our hearts for God to move, and join the rest of our church family.
on, even in the overflow right now in the chapel on the top of the hill. Let's just lift our hands up. This song leads us so well into this ministry moment. As our hands are lifted high, I'm going to invite our prayer team down. With this thought in mind, when was the last time you said thank you? When was the last time with all of our wants and needs, desires and have tos, when was the last time you gave God thanks for the things that you don't thank him for anymore? The things we take advantage of and with our hands lifted, I want to read Psalms 100 as we go into this next song. It says, shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth, worship the Lord with gladness, Come before him with singing and with joy. That's what we're doing right now, this morning, this moment. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. But enter his gates with thanksgiving. Into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. So before we ask for anything else today, Lord, we just want to say thank you. So just right now, I'm going to give you about 15 seconds in your own way. Come on, can you lift up your voice right now? And we just say thank you in our own way. Say thank you for our marriages. Thank you for our children. Thank you for our jobs. Lord, thank you for the retirement. Thank you for the breath in our lungs. The fact that we get to drive here today. Thank you that we're inside a building with heat and air and conditioning, air conditioning. Lord, thank you so much for these. Thank you that I get to come to you with my problems. Thank you that I don't have to bear these burdens on my own. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't call me to live a life of failure, but you called me to live a life of fruitfulness and life in in pursuit of you today. So this ministry moment is for the people in the room that you have a serious prayer request. But before you get there, Start with thank you. And maybe you need to come down to the altar and kneel and say thank you. Maybe you need to thank God. for Even though there might be cancer in your body, thank God for the 99% of other things that are going right. Thank God for the, for the issues that are happening. Thank, thank God. All the bad things that are happening in your marriage, thank God for the things that are going right. All the things that are going wrong in your life, thank God for the things that are going right right enter his gates the key the access to the the key of the access of to his presence is thankfulness so today come down and get your prayer requests in come down and be prayed for let people lay hands on you but maybe you just need to get to this altar and say god i'm thankful i'm thankful i'm thankful i'm thankful lord we're thankful today in jesus name and everybody said my reason 
somebody and say you look great today a little Tony the Tiger spirit come on somebody frosted flakes man hey it's so good to see everybody here this morning thank you so much for being at the 9 30 service I uh, feel like everybody shows up at 9 30 and 11 you guys we have over a hundred people in the chapel right now can we give them a hand everybody how cool is that 
So there's a whole other room of people that are listening and that are giving us space, and we just want to say thank you so much for doing that. And uh, we actually have people coming to me. I haven't seen them in months. They've just been up at the chapel the whole time, and uh, that's their new church, home away from home. So you guys, we started a campus. It's called the Chapel on the Top of the Hill. That's where it's at. And uh, we're so thankful you guys are up there and uh, give us a little space down here. If you're here for the first time, uh, my name is Pastor Nick Dalton, and uh, my wife and I, Chanel, we're the senior pastors, and we are so excited you're here today. I have met so many uh, new faces and people that have been here for maybe a couple of weeks, just kind of kicking the tires and checking under the hood to see if this is a place for them and for their family. Um, We'll be right underneath this awning over here on the way out. If you would not mind, do us a favor. There are first-time guest cards in the pew back in front of you or the seat back in front of you if you're on top in the chapel. And I, we just want some of your information just so we can uh, let you know a little bit about us. And uh, at all of our exits, including at the chapel, uh, there is a tent or a, a desk there, a, a table, where we can give you a gift for being here for the first time. And we're so thankful that you're here. Well, let's put our hands together. It's time to give, everybody. Come on, let's give God praise for that. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this is not just a a doing thing. This is a we get to thing. Lord, that this is one of those avenues of our life that can be monotonous. It can be hard. It can be difficult to keep and to maintain. But Lord, as we walk through and are finishing our 90-day tithe challenge and walking through this last month of it, Lord, I'm believing and praying and knowing, uh, hearing the great reports of what you've done in people's lives. So God, today I'm asking that you would help us, God, just to remain faithful to you, not only in the areas that are obvious, but in the areas nobody knows about because that's where character and morals really are. It's not what people see, it's what they don't see. So God, through our finances, our checkbooks, our checking accounts, all those things, help us to be faithful, God, faithful givers, faithful tithers in knowing that everything we have comes from you today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Well, these good-looking guys or gal are going to serve you here um, today, today, today. I have just one announcement, and I know that you guys uh, see the video, and um, actually, I take that back. Eight o'clock, that crowd sees the entire video because they're they're, they're here at 745. 930, you guys show up about 940. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, you might not see the whole video uh, necessarily, but uh, just one thing I want to just reiterate or, or uh, announce, and it's something we've never announced before. Um, in the eight years that we've been doing this, or that I've, we've, the church has been doing this since I've been here, um, this has never been announced like this that I can remember. Um, on May the 14th, every year since I've been here, we have had a police memorial, and this is where we have it. And what a police memorial is, is basically an opportunity for all of our armed forces to come forward, all of our uh, city and the cities around our county, our county sheriff's um, office uh, officers and our troopers that come. They all come, and we have a memorial service for all of our fallen uh, police officers, not only in our area, but in the state of Georgia um, as well. And so what we have done, or what I've done, I've been a part of this for eight years now. Pastor Mark Mobley before me, who started this tradition, um, he was the one that really kind of championed it and is always speaking, always does a great job. But basically, as a church, we've never announced it, like, hey, everybody show up. But I just feel like the people that put on bulletproof vests and strap a gun to their hip and protect us while we while we sleep, they need a little thank you, a little uh, pat on the back. And so, yeah, let's go ahead and give it to them. That's great. And so I would say that in the eight years we've done it, the most I've ever seen at one of these is about 50 people. And I would just love for us to have to pack out this church and put chairs out in the foyer and maybe even have an overflow service uh, up at the chapel for this police memorial service. So if you can, if at all possible, May the 14th at 6 p.m., we're going to have a police memorial service. Uh, And uh, so uh, Sheriff Mangum and um, Chief Worthman, all of the sheriffs and chiefs from around, they will be here. And it's all official, you know, Jefferson R.O. TC marches in. Does and it's very it's sombering, but at the same time, um, it, it's a very uh, great opportunity for us to show gratitude to the men and women that here again strap on a bulletproof vest every single day and put their life on the line so that we can sleep well at night. Whenever you call nine one one, somebody always comes for you, and we need to say thank you and show up for moments like this for them. So if you would mark your calendars, May fourteenth, six p.m., and uh, as many as you can come, uh, come on and come. Um, Today's sermon is an inspiration from um, a very, very beautiful person in my life. 
Um, it actually came from this little girl right here. You know, it's crazy where you get sermons from. Sometimes I read the Bible and I'm like, oh, sermon. Like, you know, it's, it's that simple. Uh, sometimes the Lord's doing something in my life. And I want to say, first of all, thank you to my wife, to the Lord and to my wife for giving me children because I have endless sermon content in my life right now. Like, it's just, it's always there. And uh, Georgia Beth, we call her GB. Uh, around the house. Uh, she is uh, the, the sermon content uh, creator for me today. Um, I don't have any more little kids. This is the last one we say she is faux no mo. That's what we call her. And uh, so there's no more kids coming in our life. And my wife is backstage saying amen. Um, with that being said, I know that this is all, everything she's doing is the last time, right? Until grandkids come, this is the last time. And so um, I'm, I'm hugging her a little bit longer. I'm kissing her a little bit more. And, and the problem is everybody else in the house is doing the same thing because she's the cutest thing in the house. And so Houston, Judah, Brooklyn, uh, or Chanel, myself, we're always smooching and kissing and loving on her and trying to get her to say, I love you. You know, all the affectionate things. And uh, she just gets sick of it. So here's what, G here's what GB does. GB has this stubbornness to like the nth degree. And so I'll say, George Beth, I said, do you love daddy? No. Just real matter of fact. I was like, will you give daddy a hug? No. And now like she's kind of gotten like a little nicer about it. She's like, ah, uh, like she's thinking about it. Ah, uh, no. That's what she says all the time. And so what I have found is in order to get this little girl to love on her daddy and to say I love you and all those kinds of things, there's just, I have to do some different things with Brooklyn, with Judah, with Houston. It was readily available. They would say I love you daddy all the time. They'd kiss and hug and all that. She just kind of makes you work for it. You know what I'm talking about? And so here's what I do. I, I get in with her and I kind of wrestle with her a little bit and I tickle her. You know, they say, uh, psychologists say that wrestling with your kids at a young age actually helps them uh, developmentally in their brains and their bodies. So my kids are going to be he-men because like we wrestle all the time. I do the whole cow eats corn on their leg, on their knee, and like I tickle them and do all those kinds of things. Um, but she loves that. And so I'm always sitting there tickling her and, uh, and kissing on her and doing all these things just to kind of, and wrestling with her. And she's always having fun. And then she always like stops and she looks at me, <laughs> do that again, right? Do that again, daddy. There's three D's, you know, in the front. Do that again, daddy. And, uh, and so she's, she's saying that to me, and I'm doing it again, all that kind of stuff. I get done, and within five minutes, it, it works without fail. Within five minutes, she'll run off and do her thing. She'll come back, and that little girl will just love on me, and she'll say, I love you, daddy. You know, like those kinds of things. And I know why she's saying that. She's saying that because she wants me to tickle and wrestle with her all over again. Um, she just, she knows how to get to me. But I thought to myself, all the no's I hear, trying to get her to say I love you the way the other three kids did, it's just not working this way. And sometimes to get what I want from my children or to get that affirmation from my kids, I've got to go a different way and a different journey. And it's the same thing that I think I, need to, I want to talk to you about today is that the end result, the thing that you want most in your life, sometimes you're going to have to go a different way to get it. It's not going to come about the way that you think it's going to come about. That oftentimes, would you, would you say, agree with me that when it comes to uh, visions and when it comes to like the end result, a goal for your life, that it didn't cost you a little, it cost you a lot? It didn't come in a short amount of time. It came in a long amount of time. Would, could, would you argue with me that it wasn't easier? It was actually harder to get to where you wanted to go. If you were at a business and you wanted your business to get here, it wasn't easy to do that. It took a lot of hard work. If you're you know, out of shape and to get in shape, it wasn't easy to do that. It was a lot of hard work. And sometimes these things, they don't come the way you want them to come. But Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, he says, if you want things to work out in your life, watch this, Matthew 6, he says, seek first the kingdom of God. Now this seek first is an idea of priority. I want you to prioritize me in your life. So when you drive, I want you to put me first. When you pray, I want you to put me first. When you, uh, 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 when you go somewhere uh, else in your life, uh, where's one else? when I'm mad, when I'm driving, when I wake up, when I need something, I want you to put God first in your life. So seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well, well, this idea of putting God first is not just about priority in your life. It's about the pattern. When I married my wife, December the 13th of 2008, you, if, you have, if you want to make sure you never forget that date, forget it one time and you'll never forget it ever again. December the 13th of 2008, I told her, the, I told her that one day I'm going to put you first over everybody else till death do us part, forsaking all others. That was the priority 
But how many of you know you had to continue to make a pattern of that throughout your life, the rest of your marriage, and that's what makes your marriage work. So it's not just, God, I put you first in my life in one prayer. It's what you do the next day and the next day, and the next day. It's this pattern. So when Jesus says, put God first, he's not just talking about priority, he's also talking about the pattern. And today I wanna talk about the power of the pattern in your life. So Father, today, I'm so thankful for your word. It's a light and a lamp to our feet. Lord, I pray and to our paths that God, you would help us today, Lord, to bring your word to the top uh, of everything. So Lord, that, that we would be able to receive it in such a way. Lord, if there's something deep that we need, may we receive something deep. If there's something uh, superficial, a, a gold nugget, whatever it is that we need in our life, Holy Spirit, would you reveal it to us? But ultimately, would you change our life by the preaching and the reading of the Word of God. We are so thankful that you have gotten us here today. We are so grateful. Thankfulness is what opens the key to the presence of the throne room of God in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. The context behind Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The context around it, the verses around it, Jesus is literally talking about everything you worry about. Everything, you know, when people come to me and they're worried about this, it was a, it was a, 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 you know, a bank statement, a doctor's report, something a child said, something somebody did to my child, something I did to my spouse, something my spouse did to me. There are all these issues and problems that go on in our life and are pervasive in our life. Jesus, in Matthew chapter six, kind of answers everything. He says, everything that is worrying you, everything that's bothering you, everything that keeps you up at night, and everything that you want and desire that comes in a godly fashion, fashion, Jesus says, as long as you put me first, I will be the one that will help you get to where you need to get to. In other words, seek first the kingdom of God, seek his righteousness first, and I will take care of everything else. He's talking about anxiety and fear and worry, which all of us have had, and some of us are dealing with even right now about certain areas of our life. And Jesus kind of puts the nail in the coffin of anxiety in our life, and he says, if you put me first, you don't have to worry about anything else. You don't have to worry about what clothes you wear, whether it's Louie or Fooey. Come on, somebody. Oakley's or Folkley's. Come on, you ain't got to worry about it. He said, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of what you eat, where you sleep, what happens, your health, your life, your mind. I'm going to take care of all of those things if you simply put me first. But he's not just talking about the priority of it because we could say we put God first in our life one day and then the next day go follow every idol and worry and care that we want in our life. It's not just about the priority. It's the pattern of your life. Your life speaks of a pattern. You are not where you are because you made one decision. You are where you are because you made a bunch of decisions to get where you are, good or bad. Which means to get you out of a bad situation, it's not going to be a one-time decision. It's going to be a pattern of decisions to get you out of the bad. It's the same thing with being good. If, you, if good is good and you're like, I want it to stay good, you need to continue to make a pattern of good decisions moving forward. The idea is that Jesus not only needs to be the priority of our life one time, one day, on Sunday, but it needs to be the pattern of our life. Is everybody hearing what I'm saying? It needs to be the pattern of our life, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, every day. That's not just the priority of Christ. It's the pattern of Jesus in our life. Jesus says it another way in John chapter 15. Now, if you've never heard this before, I want to just educate you on something. John 15 is a section of chapters, John 14, 15, 16, and 17, where Jesus is at the Last Supper. And at the Last Supper, he is up in the upper room. They're tearing the bread, drinking the wine. Judas is leaving, you know, betraying Jesus. This is the final conversation that Jesus is going to have with his true, uh, uh, you know, followers of, of, of Christ, like the, the 11 disciples that are there. And so as he's there, he's talking to them. And these are the last thing he's saying in this earthly body, earthly ministry. There's some pretty important things. Chapter 14 talks about heaven. Chapter 16, he talks about the Holy Spirit and the gift and the the, the gift that's gonna come. But in chapter 15, he, he pauses just for a moment and here's what he says. I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Everybody say fruitful. 
You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. He says this. Now, this is the one we know. I am the vine. You are the branches. He's repeating himself twice. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much. Everybody say much. He will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, John 15, listen to me, is not a salvation issue. We're not talking about salvation. He is literally talking to the people that are followers of Jesus Christ. They have committed their life to him. These are the believers in Jesus he's talking to. And it mentions right there in the middle that you are already clean because of the words I've spoken to you. So basically what he is saying is, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you think you bring to the table. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. There is nothing you have ever done or ever will do that deserves salvation. It is only by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. Can somebody say Amen. The Bible says, for by grace, Ephesians 2, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And it's not through your works. It's the gift of God so that you cannot boast. You do nothing. You can do nothing except receive the free gift that Jesus Christ offers us. But he talks to the believers. And he says, there's a problem. Some of you are not bearing fruit. Some of you are not connected to the vine the way that you should be. Some of you, you, you put God as a priority in your life that one time, and you said, you know, I give my life to Jesus, but it's not just about the one time. Come on, it's about the pattern of your life. Are you placing God as a priority in the patterns of your life? And here's what he says in John 15. He says, listen to me. He says, if you want to bear fruit, if you want to be successful in your walk with Jesus, if you want to have communication with God, if you want to pray prayers and prayers actually get answered, otherwise, why are we praying them? If you want these things to bear fruit in your life, if you want the life in me to come out on the inside of you, you have to stay attached to me. It's all about this idea of producing fruit. And too many times in a church, we don't talk about producing fruit. There's a lot of Christians that they're leafy but not fruit bearing. Does that make sense? They look the part. They show up to church, they do the right thing, they bring their Bibles, you know, like all those kinds of, like they, they show up in the chapel when they don't have to. I mean, like they're leafy, like things look the right way, but they're not fruit bearing. And too many times we think coming to church is all there is to Christianity and it all there is to faith and it all there is to staying connected to God is just going to church. Everybody stand up right now. Come on, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Come on, come on, stand up. Turn around, touch your seat that you just sat up from. Is it warm? Is it warm? That warm spot is not your only contribution to the body of Christ. You have got to, sit down. <laughs> you have, I hope the chapel did the same thing. I hope you guys did the same thing. You are not excluded from this. You have got to know that God saved you for more than just warming up a pew. You want to know why they call it a pew? Because if you sit there long enough, it stinks. That's why we're moving to chairs. It's not just about a one-time priority decision. It's the pattern of your life that bears fruit, that brings fruit into your life. He says in, in John 15, he says, remain in me. That I, the idea of remaining is to stay consistent, to continue in the same pattern. There are areas and times of your life, and you remember them, where you were in sync with God. I mean, you were walking with God. You were in the pattern of God, and fruit was being, was being brought forth in your life. And then all of a sudden, for one reason or another, laziness or apathy or schedules or whatever it is, other things glistening and gleaming that we went after, God's a priority, but he's not in the pattern of our life. That's why Jesus says, I need the pattern of your life to be with me, remain in me, consistent with me. You know, a lot of times we put such emphasis on the new things, <laughs> and I would say that God loves new things, and he loves to create new things on the inside of you, but he's also all about the same old mundane things in your life that matter. As I said before, you are not a result of one decision. You are a result of several decisions that you have made that have got you to this point. And I would argue in this room that it is not the new things that have really made a difference in your life. It's the consistent patterns of your life that have made a difference. 
Anybody remember that gym membership you signed up for in January? You want to know why? They, had, they wanted to get your automatic payment out of your banking account so they could still make money off of you when you don't show up, right? It's like you think this gym membership is just going to change me. It's going to change my life. I'm going to have washboard abs all over again. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's just about the gym membership. It's just about this. It's just about that. It's the new thing that you think is going to change you when it's not the new thing of going to the gym. It's actually going to the gym that matters. It's the pattern of your life that matters. I can remember um, in college, they had these things, uh, young people called planners, before they had phones that had your calendar all on the phone. They had this thing called planners. And I remember in college, I went to Walmart because I was like, this is the year I'm going to get my stuff together. All my classes, all my stuff. I'm going to know how to do things in Chinese time when I'm done with this. Because this planner I got from Walmart, y'all, it was the most expensive one. It was leather bound. It had tabs. It had like the different time zones of the world like I needed to know what they're doing in Bangkok, right? Like, like there, there are all these different things that are happening. And I remember thinking, this is the thing that's going to change my life. You know where that thing ended up? The back of my car. Never saw it again. New things don't matter as much as the pattern of your life that matters. Some of us think a new marriage is gonna fix something. A new relationship is gonna fix something. It's not the new that matters. It's the pattern of your life. It's the pattern of your relationships and the pattern of your marriage that matters the most. Patterns, patterns. But before I go any further, I need to just give you a little bit of a, of a side note. I get people coming to me that talk to me about the patterns of their life. And just as I said, patterns can get you somewhere good. Patterns can always also get you somewhere bad. I know people that you do things that I like to call stupid patterns. You know what that is? That's when you do the same thing over and over expecting different results. You stay around those friends. You stay around that group. You stay around this stuff, you stay around that thing, whatever it is, and it consistently gets you back to where you don't want to be. That's a stupid pattern, and you need to get out of that in your life. There's another pattern. I got two of them. I got 15 of them, and I'm just going over three. The second one is a scared pattern. That's, that's that worry, that anxiety, that it always leads you down this path. I always go this way. I get on my phone. I get on social media. I get on Facebook. I see the news. I see the world. I see all this stuff, and it just begins to, to create a pattern of worry and anxiety and fear in your life. Get out of that pattern, that stagnant pattern, and so many of us in this room, we can relate to that because maybe our marriages seem stagnant. Raising our kids are, is getting old. It's like, aren't you supposed to be mature by now? You know, like, like paying bills is getting, all these things that we have in our life, it just gets old. Trying to get out of debt, trying to do the right thing. All these things just get old and it becomes stagnant, same, no passion patterns in our life. But the pattern that God's talking about, this priority and pattern in your life, when you do it God's way and you stay connected to the vine and you seek first the kingdom of God, not just in a one-time decision, but in the series of decisions to follow, here's what happens. Number one, faithfulness is going to produce fruitfulness in your life. Fruitfulness. Now, fruitfulness is basically what God wants to see out of your life. It's what we want to see out of our life. If we are followers of Jesus Christ, our job is supposed to be, God, what do you want to come through this body out of my life? What do you want to produce in my life? That is why the Bible calls it fruitfulness. And very obviously, faithfulness to God is going to produce fruitfulness. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3 says, let love and faithfulness. Everybody say faithfulness. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and with man. Just being faithful to the Lord. Just being faithful in the things God has called you to be faithful for. Just creating patterns of faithfulness in your life will produce the life that God wants for you. Can somebody say amen? I grew up over by Athens Tech most of my life. And um, right there on that highway that gets you into Colbert, right before you get to Hull, there's, a, there's a, a, some houses on the right there, and basically all the, my family kind of grew up around there, and I lived there for a majority of my life. And it was a, I, I don't know if you'd call it an orchard or not, but there are about 60 uh, pecan trees. Now, if you're in this room and you say pecan, you can be dismissed right now in Jesus' name. That is not how you say it. This is the South. You need to learn some new lingo. Is, is there's two acceptable phrases. You could say, 
uh, pecan or you can say pecan, one of the two, all right? That if you're from Savannah, you say pecan, like that's how it goes. But otherwise, it's pecan or pecan. I grew up in a pecan orchard, I guess you would say, all these trees around me. And if, and if you kind of know what I'm talking about, my granddaddy, he would let people come out. He didn't have time to pick up all those pecans and take them to the market. I guess he did at some point in his life. But as he got older, he didn't, he didn't want to see that. He didn't want to do that, too much work. So he would allow people, they would drive up in our yard. I mean, just random strangers drive up in our yard. Would anybody ever do that in 2024, right? He would just let people drive up in, in, in the yard, and he would let them go out. They'd get their big quilts or blankets. They'd lay them out on the ground. They'd throw all their pecans on there, and they'd gather them up, and they'd take them and go and do whatever you're going to do with them. And granddad, there were 60 trees to choose from. There was one tree you could not get pecans from because that was his tree. Those pecans were enormous. Those pecans were amazing. Those pecans were incredible. And I just thought to myself, man, that's my granddaddy's tree. Matter of fact, it sat right outside my granddaddy's kitchen window. And as sweet as my granddaddy was, he would eyeball out that window every now and then just to make sure nobody was picking his pecans off of his tree. I remember that. I remember how much he loved going out there and picking stuff up. I remember how he taught me how to crack pecans. You know, a lot of people don't know how to do that. I remember how you don't eat the whole pecan, otherwise, ugh, it's nasty, right? Like there's just certain ways. He knew all about it. He knew everything. But you know the one thing that he taught me? He taught me this tree has the best pecans because it has been here the longest. It has stayed rooted. It was the oldest tree in the yard. He said it stayed, it's been here the longest. It's been here more than all the rest. Before The reason why we planted all these other pecans is because when we built the house, that was right there. That, that tree was right there. So that's why it's been there the longest. It's this faithfulness that produces the best fruit, that produces fruitfulness in our life. And Granddaddy told me one time, he said that tree, not one day in his life has that tree ever worried about producing pecans. Not one day. You know, that tree is not sitting there going, oh, don't be a banana, please. Oh, please. Don't be a banana. They will chop me down. And, you know, what? that, that tree's not out there throughout. You're going, ah. <laughs> pecans, oh, thank God. That tree never does that. You know what that tree does? It stays rooted, it stays planted, it stays where it is. Same thing day after day after day after year after year. And guess what? It produces the harvest and the crop that its creator was meant for it to do. And I want you to know in this room that if you stay connected to Jesus, he will produce the same things in your life and you won't have to worry about them. So many of us <laughs> are white knuckling our way through Christianity. Oh, I gotta be more loving. Ah, I gotta forgive. Ah, you know, I, I gotta pray more. Ah, no, 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 no. If you just stay connected to Jesus, you don't have to worry about producing fruit. The gardener and the vine will produce fruit through you as long as you stay faithful. Can somebody say amen? I, they're clapping up at the hill. I want y'all to know that right now. Top of the hill, they're clapping, aren't you? I know, I know you are. You know, it's easy to, to look at something and say, man, that has potential. That tree's got potential. That land's got potential. That what it got potential. You know what potential is? Potential is I say you have potential if I look at the patterns of your life and you have proven to me that you can do what you say you're going to do. That's, that's potential. For instance, my, my daughters, as they get older, my daughter is not dating. She's going out, you know, with people. That's not dating. I'm going out, you know, whatever that is. But whenever they begin to date at the age of 25, whenever that happens, come on, Dare, you know what I'm talking about. Whenever that happens, whenever that happens, um, I'm not, a lot, of, a lot of fathers, they're like, you know, stepping away, you know, looking, gl glaring, glooming, you know, over them, whatever, polishing the, you know, the 357 Magnum, like those kinds of things, right? Like that's what most dads do. I don't think I want to do that. I want to be up in this kid's grill. <laughs> want to know why? Because I know who you are based on the patterns of your life. I don't need to know if you, I can tell if you have potential or not based on what you, how do you treat your mama? How do you treat your sisters? How do you treat, how do you treat authority? How do you spend your money? What interest do you have? 
one of them better not be my daughter. You know what I'm talking about? Like just, just things like that. I, there, are, there are patterns. It's so obvious, it's so simple that sometimes a preacher getting up here preaching, it just seems like it's a dumb sermon. But it's really not because if you understand that the patterns of somebody's life is what determines their potential, it's the same thing in your life with Jesus, that the patterns of your life will produce fruitfulness in your life. When you sow, you're gonna reap. When you forgive, you're gonna be forgiven. When you confess your sins one to another, the Bible says in James, you will be healed. And sometimes just showing up, just being faithful, just serving, just parenting, just being married, just saving instead of spending, sometimes those patterns of your life, the Bible says, will produce the fruitfulness that God desires out of you just by doing the same thing because faithfulness leads to fruitfulness. The second thing is this, time is actually in your favor. (laughs) It's actually your friend. I heard somebody say this. They said, if something grows overnight, it's a weed. But if it takes time, and produ- it, it will produce something. It does, it's not a weed, it's a plant. It's something that you want or desire in your life. And so many times we have friendships that just pop up. Maybe they do in weed. Maybe that's why they just popped up in your life. But I'm telling you, it's a weed. Listen, watch, 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 listen. You've got to understand that sometimes things that just happen and pop up overnight, that's not God's thing. That's the enemy trying to get you redirected out of the path God wants you to have. Because I'm telling you, through Scripture, through the Word of God, God says new things are good. Let me create new things in you. Otherwise, stay connected and stay faithful with priority in the pattern of your life. You know, kids... We go to trips, road trips. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. You get in the car, and they always ask you, when are we going to be there? Are we there yet? How many, how many more miles? Whatever. I put the GPS on the screen, and whenever they ask me that question, I just point to the screen. I don't even talk to them anymore. <laughs> I just point to the screen, and I said, here it is. From a young age, we think time is against us. As you get older, <laughs> you discover You don't have a lot of time anymore. You don't have what you thought you used to have. But can I tell you something? When you're faithful to God, time works for you. When you're faithful to the Lord, when you get in this book, when you when you put on, when you get on your knees and you pray, time is your friend and it works for you because it's all in God's time. Joshua was the next in line after this great leader, Moses. And Moses is gone, and Joshua comes up, and, and the Bible says that the Lord shows us up to Joshua and says, I want you to take over Jericho. And in this moment, you're like, man, this is awesome. So Joshua comes to the people of Israel. He says, guys, you know, millions of them. He says, guys, we're gonna take Jericho. It's a big old wall, big city, big soldiers, big everything, and we're just these small, tiny people, but God's gonna give us Jericho. Can't you imagine how that was going? I mean, they're, they're chest bumping. They're like, you know, dabbing. All, you know, they're doing all kinds of stuff. They're doing all kinds of stuff just so excited about what God's going to do in their life. Yes, we get to go. We get to do this. And Joshua says, so here's what we're going to do. He says, grab your spears, your swords, your shields, your helmets, your trumpets. Trumpets. Grab everything you can. And we're going to walk around Jericho. Boy, how did that go? You're all like excited and pumpy about getting ready to defeat some Jerichoans. I don't know how I say it, but you know. And all of a sudden he goes, yeah, we're not fighting them. We're going to walk. Those people are like, Joshua's here. Where'd Moses go? Can we get Moses back? No, nah, Moses just disappeared. He's on an island with Elvis somewhere. That's where Moses is. But anyway, like, like what? How, Joshua, what are we supposed to do? He's like, yeah, we're just going to walk. So you know what day one of defeating Jericho looked like? Day one. Exciting, isn't it? You know what day two looked like? Day two. You know what raising your kids looks like? (laughs) You know what being married for 30 years looks like? You know what raising your family in church looks like? You know what saving and not spending every dime you got looks like? Same old, same old. I'm dizzy. Same, (laughs) Same old, same old patterns. Did that for six days because it's God's time. Because when you're on God's side, time works in your favor. Not a pebble fell, a rock wall didn't shudder, and nobody was (laughs) lost in battle. 
But in that time frame, God was teaching them to trust what I'm doing in you, trust the process, trust and know that the reward is coming as long as you stay faithful to me and as long as you are connected and moving in the right direction. Time is to your advantage. So don't give up. Galatians 6, 9, one of my favorite verses. Don't give up when you're doing the right thing. This is, this is a pattern throughout Scripture. Don't give up when you're doing the right thing, and you know you're doing the right thing. Don't give in. Don't give up. Don't let go. Don't quit. Because if you quit, you lose. If you keep going, you win. Why? Because God allows time to work in your favor. Can somebody say amen? Number three, the Bible says you will bear fruit. You will bear fruit, but sometimes time gets a little old. <laughs> it's like, am I really going to do this over and over and over? And you have to change your mindset. And this is one that's a little bit difficult to get, but I need you to get this. Everybody listen to me. Is that the routine or the process, it actually becomes the reward in your life. If you are in the faith Believer, if you're in the family of believers, if you are in the faith and following Jesus simply because of what Jesus can do for you, you've gotten it wrong. If you're doing this because you think it's health, wellness, and prosperity, you're in the wrong church and you're reading the wrong Bible. If you think that all that God can give you is only good things and great things, go read the book of Job and it'll blow your mind. The, the point is not the goal. The point is not the end result. What you discover is that may be what started But as you grow faithful and as you get close to God and as you are connected to him, the process or the routine actually becomes the reward. In other words, the routine of your life actually becomes something you begin to look forward to. But this is something you cannot take my word for. You've got to do it yourself. You say, well, I don't like reading my Bible. Because you don't read your Bible. I don't like praying. Because you don't pray. I don't like worshiping. Because you don't worship. But when you follow the faithful patterns of your life and you get, there's a goal somewhere. I want to be more like Jesus. That's the goal. I want, to, I want to receive miracles or breakthroughs in my life or I need this chain broken. Whatever it is that you're praying for, that's the end goal and result. And God says fruitfulness will come. But it's the process that's going to get you there that's going to change your life more than the miracle, more than the breakthrough. Can somebody say amen? You see, if fruit was the reward, the routine would just be monotony. And how many of you know the routine's the major part of our Christian faith and walk? (laughs) You know, and I love the Gospels, but every single day, I I might be blasphemous in saying this, but I might be a heretic, there wasn't a miracle every single day. They were walking from one way to another, and maybe Jesus was just talking and just, I, I think the point of the disciples following Jesus was not so they could do miracles. It was so they would know the heart of the Father. It was so they would get closer to Jesus, and so they'd, they would understand that this routine is, is the majority of my faith walk. It's this process. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like running. <laughs> Anybody that says they love running, they need to get checked medically. Um, but I've heard people that talk about my goals of 5K, my goals of whatever, uh, <laughs> they say, I've ran a half marathon. I'm like, I'm half impressed. Anyway, um, so <laughs> stop, stop. That was funny though, wasn't it? Sorry, stop. Okay, stop. They have this goal. They have this goal, but what they have found, DJ, you can come, you gotta help me. What they have found is that it was the training that got them there that made them fall in love with running, not the actual meeting of the goal. And I've, I've had so many people that missed the goal, missed the mark, still running. Why? It was the process. It was the routine they fell in love with. It's, we, we, many of us approach our faith like we approach diets. I'm going to do this diet for about two weeks, and if I don't get my results, I'm quitting. That's my diet plan. I had Diet Coke yesterday, everybody. I felt real proud of myself. That's how I approach diets. I'm going to do it for about two or three weeks, maybe, maybe, with the cheat day every now and then. <laughs> and if I don't get my results in that time, I'm done. This is stupid, right? That's, that's the way many of us treat our faith. Chanel, on the other hand, she doesn't do a diet. She does a lifestyle change. That changed the game. That girl hadn't had a piece of bread since September. So we hadn't been to Texas Roadhouse in a long time. Y'all pray for me. <laughs> I'm just saying, 
she chose a lifestyle change that she stuck with. And now it's like, instead of thinking about the things she can't have, she focuses on how many amazing things she can have. Like, in my diets, I know that insomnia cookie in Athens is open till 3 a.m. I know that. Chanel knows that insomnia cookie has gluten-free cookies. So she's going to go for a gluten-free cookie. And it's just, instead of worrying about she can't have a bag of Chips Ahoy or EL Fudge or homemade, whatever, y'all bake us cookies. I thank y'all so much. She can't have any of them. But she loves insomnia cookie because they open until 3 (laughs) a.m. And they got gluten-free. She, instead of focusing on things she can't have, she focuses on the thanks. She's thankful for what she does have, where she can go, what is happening in her life. And it's this mindset that has changed her that she realizes is the process or the routine that becomes the reward. I feel like I'm leaving something off that I need to say. But I'll move on to number four, probably the most important. It's very frustrating to get to this part. A lot of, a lot of you are here. You've got to identify the season you're in. Many of us want to rush God and say, God, hadn't I prayed for it for three weeks? 21 days of prayer. I've been without food or coffee for three days. God, it's time to do something, right? We get frustrated. We say, God, why haven't these kids turned out the way I want them to yet? Why, haven't my, why hasn't my marriage done this? Why, why are my finances not? And we get all huffy and puffy and get flustered with God. But what we don't realize is God says, you are the vine. You're, you're the branches. I'm the vine. He's the gardener. There's phases and seasons of your life. You know, in every fruit-bearing plant, there's, there's different seasons. <laughs> there's the dormancy season, which is where it looks like nothing's going to come, and it looks like it's dead. Chanel has a rose bush that's 14 years old. I know it's 14 years old because her aunt gave it to her when we brought Brooklyn home from the hospital. We have moved several times. I think we've, I think we've moved seven times in about 10 years. We've moved that thing, that, it's going with us. Like whenever somebody buys a house, she goes, just know that rose bush ain't going with y'all, it's coming with us. Like that's the way she is. And so we have planted that thing several times and I promise you we thought we killed it every single time. This year, more roses on that bad boy than you have ever seen before. It looked dead. It looked like it wasn't going to make it. But that was just the season it was in. Can I just encourage somebody today? If it looks like God's not answering your prayer and it looks like nothing's happening, it might just be the season you're in. It doesn't mean fruit's not coming. It doesn't mean flowers won't bloom. It doesn't mean the sun won't shine. And it doesn't mean that all the processes you're going through right now are worthless and for nothing because they're not. God is trying to do something on the inside of you. And you have to realize that every season is not going to be a fruit-bearing season. Sometimes there are dormancy seasons, learning seasons, hurting seasons, growing seasons, pruning seasons. Psalms chapter 1 verse 3 says, The person that God blesses is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields fruit in its season." So many times, if you don't recognize what season you are in, you will push the eject button out of the journey that God has for your life because you're frustrated. Well, church ain't going my way. Just stay planted. Well, serving's not making a difference. Just keep serving. Well, giving, God hadn't done it. Just keep giving. Well, this marriage, just stay married. (laughs) Or raising my kids, listen to me, listen to me. Be a good parent. Do the right thing. Make the right calls. Be a house of discipline and of love, grace and discipline at the same time. But you will abort the season of life that God, you will abort the gift and the blessing that God has for you by pushing the ejection button simply because you don't recognize the season you are in. If you start a business expecting to make a million dollars day one, it's not gonna happen. It's a season to get you to the place where you're supposed to be. God is saying the same thing in John 15 and in Matthew 6. He is saying the patterns of your life, I'm taking you through seasons, and I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, you will bear fruit. You will bear fruit. You want that promotion? God says, I got you. Be faithful in the little things. You want those kids that want to come home when they can leave home? You want that kind of family? God says, I got you. Train up a child in the way they should go. 
You want that family that's saved and you're going to see each other when you're in heaven one day? God says, I've got you. Train up a child in the way they should go and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Put the book, book of the law in front of them day and night. Meditate on it day and night. <laughs> Pastor Nick, you want that new building, that, that, that mill? Okay, there's a season of building that has felt like forever and eternity and forever again, right? But it's a season. How crazy would it be for me to go, up? Oh, it's not gonna happen. Let's just stay where we're at. That's what some of you are getting ready to do. There is a promise and a future and a miracle and a breakthrough and there's something God has for you on the other side of a season. Don't press the eject button just yet. Wait on the Lord. Remain in him, the Bible says. Stay connected to the vine. You have one responsibility in life. I'm ready to give everybody their one responsibility. You guys ready? You guys ready? Don't try to be God. Let God be God and you just follow what he says and what he does. Because he says it twice. You're the branch. Jesus is the vine. And the Father is the gardener. So, when I want to get something from my little girl, <laughs> wrestle and tickle and all those things and kisses, when I want the I love you and the kiss and, the, and all the, the, the sweet things, I've got to wrestle and do it. And then she says, Daddy, do it again. It's a pattern that brings results. So let me just give you a little last bit of information, help from the life of Georgia Beth Dalton. Ready? Here it is. Do it again. I've prayed a lot. Do it again. I've given them second chances a lot. Do it again. I've forgiven a lot. Do it again. I've read the Bible so much. Do it again. I'm tired of saving. I want to spend. Save again. Keep going. And watch what the faithfulness of God produces in your life. Can we bow our heads and close our eyes just for a moment? As you heard me say in the beginning, that this John 15 passage, he's speaking to believers, but there are people in this room that you are walking through seasons of your life without purpose. You're walking through seasons of your life that, don't, that won't matter and won't add up. They don't matter in eternity. They'll only matter in this life. And I wanna give you an opportunity to surrender your life to Jesus so that your life matters. So that you don't have to be fearful. You don't have to worry. You don't have to have anxiety. You don't have to deal with those things because you know, I can trust God. I'm gonna put him first, not just today, but the next day. Every day of my life, I'm going to trust God. If you're here today and you haven't done that, you've walked away from the faith, you're not where you need to be with the Lord, you need to get right with God, make a fresh start, or maybe for the first time, surrender your life to Jesus. If that's you, this is your moment. Up in the chapel, this is your time. Heads bowed and eyes closed, not to embarrass anybody, but you say, Pastor Nick, today's the day the Holy Spirit's reaching out for me and I need to give my life to Jesus. The patterns of my life, I need to surrender my life to Jesus right now. I need to get right with God. If that's you in this room, would you lift up your hand? If you're in the chapel, would you lift up your hand and say, today's the day I need to make a fresh start? Today's the day I need to give my life to Jesus. I need to get right with the Lord, surrender my life to him. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand right now? Right now. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Bible says that we should confess and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. If we do those things, we will be saved. That sign of belief is raising your hand. I believe I can't do this on my own. I believe Jesus is the only way. I believe my sins are not gonna lead me to the life that I wanna live, that God wants for me. So today, I'm surrendering it all. I'm repenting. I'm walking away from my old life. And today, I start a brand new life with Jesus that's your belief, I want to ask you to repeat this prayer. Say it with as much faith as you can as our church family, both down here and in the chapel, says it together. Say, dear Jesus, say thank you that today you have saved me. Today I have reached out and today I receive the free gift of salvation. Say, I repent, I walk away from my old life, my old decisions, and my old sin, and I walk faithfully towards you 
from this moment and for the rest of my life. Say thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy in this moment. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. If you make a decision to accept Christ today, we would love to celebrate with you and provide you with the next step on your newfound relationship with Jesus. You can do this by going to jefferson.church backslash next step. Are you interested in getting more connected or taking your next steps at PJC? Follow us on social media.